Hello and welcome to lecture 14 of Introduction to Computational Literary Analysis. Uh, today we're going to talk about stylometry, uh, more on dealing with lots of uh, text at the same time, and here we go. All right, so uh, stylometry. So stylometry is just what it sounds like. It's a uh, measurement of style. So what do I mean by style? Um, well, if you look at the most frequent words of any text, um, you're going to find words like little words like the, an, a, uh, uh, he, she, you know, these are sometimes called uh, stop words. Uh, but they're also style words. And what I mean by style is, and what stylometricians mean by style, is that um, the, the kind of subliminal style of a writer that we often don't register as readers, it happens it happens in these uh, very tiny words that happen very frequently. And uh, so that means that the lesser frequent words, you know, uh, these tend to be uh, content words more often. Okay, so uh, what does that look like in practice? Well, uh, let's load a whole bunch of texts and take a look. So, um, yeah, one of the things that I wanted to show you really quick was that you can get a lot of texts uh, using something that I wrote uh, called Corpus DB. So Corpus DB is at HTTP blah 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 uh, Corpus DB dot org. Um, it's an API which stands for uh, Application programming interface and what that means is it's basically just like a website for computers to use instead of for humans so what does that mean well uh, let's take a look so if we open up corpusdb.org uh, here you can see that it's it's pretty bare bones you know because this is the human facing part of it um, but if we go over here to the API documentation, you can see that there are all of these specialized URLs that we can use um, to get machine-readable data out of this database. Um, so this is called a, a REST API, and that stands for Representational State Transfer, um, which we don't really have to worry about right now because you can sort of figure out what it does just by playing around with this a little bit. So if I copy a URL like this, um, this is going to be the metadata for this book with this ID, Project Gutenberg ID number nine. So uh, this is basically sort of like a wrapper around Project Gutenberg. So um, I'm looking at this in Firefox and, and uh, Firefox is neat because it sort of, it gives us a nice view of this but it tells you all of the metadata that it's returning uh, for this number nine, um, number nine text. So um, the title here is Abraham Lincoln's First Inaugural Address. It's ID number nine in Project Gutenberg. So that means that you can go to uh, Project Gutenberg, uh, gutenberg.org slash ebooks and then number nine and you see what we're looking at is Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address and now it's a little bit better than Project Gutenberg's version because I've done a lot of work to sort of clean up the metadata you can get the metadata here you can see that um, Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address uh, you can see the language it's in you can see the category of the text all of this stuff but um, here this is machine readable so what I mean by machine readable is that it's easy to parse this information out using Python or another programming language 
Um, so there's lots of stuff that you can get out of this. You can get it out the language. You can find uh, the URL. You can get um, the Library of Congress subject heading, which is uh, kind of like a bibliographic classification uh, for this document that tells you what kinds of subjects it belongs to. Um, you can get yeah, a whole bunch of other useful information out of it. So, you know, one is the, the Moonstone. The Moonstone is in Project Gutenberg. So if we were to look at this, uh, we can tell here that this is ebook number 155. Uh, great. So ebook number 155, Corpus DB um, makes you put in 0. 0.0. Um, and then here we can see all of this useful information about um, the Moonstone. So uh, this is lots of enhanced metadata about this novel. Um, a lot of this I've added from Wikipedia, um, kind of half automatically. So for example, here are all of the subjects uh, in Wikipedia for the Moonstone. It says that it was made into a 1934 film. It was made into um, a British television film. It belongs to a category called uh, locked room mysteries, and it belongs to a category called epistolary novels. Uh, now you have lots of other data here that I've added. I can, um, yeah, so this is interesting. You know, PR is the Library of Congress category for uh, British literature. Uh, we have Lots of other Wikipedia links. We have some literary genres here, um, and we have a little description. So lots of very useful uh, data we're getting from Corpus DB, but here's where it gets even uh, more useful. So we can get um, all of the metadata for all books by a certain author. And to do that, we just have to use a URL in that form. So slash API slash author slash uh, Collins comma Wilkie. And now this gives us a ton of stuff. Um, so it gives us, to be um, precise, it gives us 41 texts. So we have 41 texts by Wilkie Collins. And um, this first one is, let's see what the title is of this one. Yeah, I wish this were alphabetized uh, because I can't find, okay, yeah, so the first one is the Moonstone. The second one is the Haunted Hotel. And now sometimes you have multiple copies of the same book, uh, but we have 41 works in Project Gutenberg. Um, 41 works uh, by Wilkie Collins. So you can already see that uh, this could be useful to, to get all of those texts without having to go to Project Gutenberg and, and download each one individually. In other words, we're uh, writing a little program to do that process for us. And so that's why I wrote uh, Corpus DB, was to, um, was to allow you to assemble corpora a whole lot easier. So. Looking back at this API documentation, we can see that we can also get the full text uh, for certain books. Uh, probably the best way to do that is to use a URL in this format. So if we were to do this on uh, number nine, uh, text number nine, you can see it gives us um, full text. Yeah, the full text of Abraham Lincoln's address. And now uh, we remember that the Moonstone is 155. So if we were to just take 155.0 and append full text, you can see now uh, we get the full text of the Moonstone. And you'll notice a few differences here uh, between my copy of it and Project Gutenberg's copy. So if you look at Project Gutenberg's copy, um, you can see that it contains a whole lot of fluff at the beginning. You know, it says this ebook is for the use of anyone, anywhere, blah, blah, blah. And if you look at the very end, 
Um, you can see it includes lots of legal uh, mumbo jumbo that is um, also kind of like irrelevant to a text analysis, right? Because if you keep all of this stuff in, um, later you will find that, you know, a lot of texts have this, you know, lots of stuff about Project Gutenberg itself, which is not what we want in a text analysis. So I've already done the work of cleaning all of these texts programmatically for you um, to streamline some things. All right, so how do we use this in Python? Well, we uh, use a library called requests. So I'm going to import requests. And we've done this before, uh, but we didn't really talk about it a whole lot. If you make a git request, a git request says, you know, go to the internet, grab that URL, and get me the result. So we want um, to get, why don't we say, let's get the metadata first of the Moonstone. So that's this URL, corpusdb.org slash API slash ID slash 155.0. So this is the metadata. In fact, I can um, annotate this. Get metadata for the Moonstone. And it says response 200. Um, typically, we would store this in some kind of variable and call it like a response. You want to check the response first um, and make sure it turned out OK. You know, so 200 is OK. HTTP responses codes cats. Um, I think this is a really great mnemonic device. Um, HTTP response codes are things like 200. So 200 is OK. This is the cat response for 200. Um, you prob you've probably encountered uh, 404 not found at some point. Um, there are plenty of other HTTP codes, unsupported media type. One is even called I'm a teapot. Uh, there's a long story behind that, which we won't get into now, but it has a Wikipedia article and you can uh, read about it. It's pretty funny. All right, but back to this. Um, so we want to make sure that that re response is OK. So we can do response.ok. If it comes back true, then we know it's OK. Um, and if it's OK, uh, we can usually get text out of it. So if we do response.text, we can see uh, this is all of the metadata. So this is in a format called JSON, or uh, JSON, depending on who you're talking to. And all we have to do to parse that is to get this uh, JSON library called JSON. And we could say, hey, JSON library, uh, decode this. I think, I think it's decode. I think that's the, it's not decode, it's, I think it's load s for load string. So we have this string from response.txt, and we want to load it using the JSON library. So now it's parsed it, it's sort of, it's turned it into this um, data structure now, which is like a dictionary containing dictionaries, sometimes containing lists. So I can call this moonstone data, and I can explore it the same way I would explore any data structure. So I can open up the contextual help, and look at it, and it tells me it's a dictionary, and it's a dictionary that contains lots of stuff. So what kinds of things are in the dictionary? Well, I can get a list of them by doing dot keys, and it tells me I can get the author year of death, the author year of birth. I can get the formats that it's in. I can get the bookshelf that it's in on Project Gutenberg. Lots of useful information. You know, if I wanted to get the author out of this, I could say Moonstone data. What is the author? It says uh, Wilkie Collins. What about title? The Moonstone. So this is great. So that's how to get metadata from one text. Uh, but to get metadata for, here I'll close this, to get metadata for the whole author, uh, there's something that I could do there uh, too. So I could say author is Collins 
Wilkie. And then response text is going to be a whole bunch of metadata about all of the text in Project Gutenberg that have that author. So I can, um, I can go ahead and load that with JSON. And I can call this parsed response or something, but parsed response, now if I were to look at that, it tells me it's a list of length 42. So these are 42 entries from Wilkie Collins. So I can write a list comprehension to go through each of those. Um, I could say, hey, get me the title of each item in the parsed response. And it goes through and it gets me the title of all of these works uh, by Wilkie Collins. Yeah, so quite a lot. You know, so if I wanted to make a Wilkie Collins uh, corpus, I could, I could use any uh, number of these. You know, um, I might want to see if they're, might want to make sure that they're novels first. But yeah, it'll get me started. So some of the, you know, I'm not going to want all of them, you know, because some of them are not in English. This one is in French. This is probably, I'm guessing, Finnish. Um, there are lots of works in there that we don't necessarily want. So why don't I get just the first 10 of them? So I can just grab the first 10 from that response, call it uh, Collins Corpus Metadata. Now for each of these, yeah, I want to get those IDs. So I could do the same thing. I could say item ID. Actually, instead of item, I can call it book because that makes a lot more sense uh, for book in Collins Corpus Meta. Does it have ID? Yeah, great. So that's a string of a floating point number. Uh, but that's fine, I'll keep it like that. So I could call this Collins Corpus IDs. And now I could go through and I can make a function that gets the plain text for all of those. So um, we're going to do it the same way, you know, get full text for some ID. See, it's turned green because ID is a reserved word, so we have to choose something like book ID. So given a book ID, um, we are going to use requests to get something from corpusdb.org slash API. And it's ID. And then we're just going to put that I book ID in here as an F string. Actually, why don't I do this on a different line just to make this more explicit? So I can say this is my URL. That's a URL. And now I can check to make sure it's OK. You know, um, if it's not OK, I can do something like print error response not OK. Abandon ship. Uh, but if it is OK, uh, then we have the response that we need, and we can try to decode it. So I can load uh, that response dot text into JSON, um, and that's going to be my full text. 
Yeah, and then I can return that full text. But um, because of the data structure of that full text, remember it looks like this. It returns a list and a dictionary where the first item is text. I can just grab the first item and get uh, the text value from that. So let's try this out. I know 155, I think, is the moon sun, right? Right, and I have to call it using parentheses, not index it. I've spelled this inconsistently. OK, so it's, it doesn't like this yet. So let's try it with nothing first. Right, so that's getting me the metadata, but what I want is actually the full text. Great, that's the full text of the Moonstone. So yeah, I was right before. I want to get zero with item and the text out of that. Great. So you know, this is another way of getting the Moonstone. Now if I were to run this and look at something, you know, like the length of the Moonstone, it tells me the length in, in characters of this text. So that, you know, you can see that this is really nice because now that we have a function, we could just write a for loop and we could say, you know, for each book ID in uh, Collins corpus IDs, get that full text. And now we can append this to some list if we want, like Collins texts. But instead of just 155, uh, we're going to get that book ID. You know, and we could have also written this as a list comprehension, too. But uh, you see, this will take some time because it's going to get each one. Yeah, and I should have 10 texts. So that's that's pretty great. Now we have a corpus of uh, texts in this 10. We would also want to keep track of things like titles. So, you know, maybe we could do something that says, uh, get me the title for each uh, book in, what is it, Collins Corpus Meta. Now, how many of these titles do I have? I have 10. Great, so we're keeping track of the titles and the texts. All right, so why don't we try um, a little bit of stylometry. So again, stylometry is a measurement of style. Um, and it tracks the most frequent words. So style words are usually like from the 100th most frequent word to about the 800th most frequent word. So um, a great way to go ahead and do this is to do this using scikit-learn, which we just learned. And yeah, in fact, to make it a little bit easier, instead of importing the whole thing, we could say, from that library, we're going to import some stuff. So it's like feature extraction text. And then the ones that we want are count vectorizer. Um, we also want TF-IDF vectorizer, TF-IDF transformer. And I'll explain what TF-IDF is uh, a little bit later. OK, so we have a count vectorizer. And we played around with this already. So we've done things like 
you know, gotten the counts of a whole bunch of text documents all at once uh, using this. So I want to introduce a, a new one, uh, which is TFIDF Vectorizer. So this does the same thing as Count Vectorizer, only it um, looks at proportions of words and not necessarily counts of words. So uh, to get proportions of words in a text, not just their counts, use TFIDF vectorizer. OK, so we can initialize this. just by giving it like a, a slightly different name. And I can say, um, I can tell it all of the things that I want to do. So I can give it all of the options uh, that I want it to have. So I can say, I can tell it whether to ignore stop words. I could um, do this thing, which is very useful for stylometry, which is that I tell it I'm only interested in getting the words that are um, that are the most frequent words. So if I tell it to get 100 max uh, features, it will get the 100 most frequent words in the text. Um, I can also tell it to use what's known as uh, IDF, which I'll talk about um, in just a second. All right, so TF IDF. Um, let's talk about this for just a second before diving into that. Yeah, so if I were to just look up on Wikipedia, TFIDF, it tells me a few useful things. Um, and as usual, it tells me a little bit uh, too much. But basically, the term frequency um, is what is meant by TF. And that refers to uh, just how often just how often like a token happens in the document but document frequency is how often that term happens in uh, the corpus right so how many documents in the corpus uh, does it happen in so tfidf is term frequency adjusted for inverse uh, document frequency where term frequency is how often does it occur in the single text and document frequency how many texts does it occur in in the corpus in a larger corpus. So we can adjust all kinds of things um, when we vectorize a text or a corpus using TFIDF. You know, so again, we can, we can tell it that we're only interested in words or features that happen in 100% of all of the documents. Or, you know, we're only interested in in ones that appear in like 10% of the documents. So yeah, if you give it an integer or if you give it a floating point number for either of these two values, it treats them differently. So if you give it um, a min minimum document frequency of one, it says it must appear in at least one document uh, to count it, which is kind of like the default it's meaningless but if you say 1.0 uh, it means it must occur in 100 percent of all of those so um, it's a proportion rather than an integer you know so if we say min df equals 1.0 it says we're only interested in words that appear in all of the documents um, we could say we're only interested in let's say the top 400 most frequent words 
And what are other things that we could do? We could lowercase it, yet we're already doing that. We could use the default tokenizer, we're already doing that. We can change that later. Um, but for now, we can turn off IDF. Um, because, yeah, we're not going to be using IDF uh, just yet. So this turns it into basically something that just only looks at the term frequencies. So uh, you'll see we'll use a lot of these values. We'll change some of these values a whole lot. And it is a really great idea to play around with all of these. Um, try out a whole bunch of other values of, of those parameters so that you can get a feel for uh, which ones are working for the kind of analysis that you're trying to do. So if I fit and transform this, and if I give it a list of raw documents, then it will learn the vocabulary and the IDF. This is kind of machine learning language, but it's really just counting the words. And return a term document matrix. So this is basically the kind of thing that we're doing. It's just uh, it uses different terminology to, to describe this. So I can give it a list of all of my Collins texts. And this is going to make Collins uh, frequencies. Actually, it's going to do that if I make this a dense matrix. I mean, it's still the same data. I'm just filling it in a little bit. So that shows us the matrix. It's not very meaningful right now, though. Um, so why don't we make this into a nicer looking thing uh, by putting this into a pandas data frame. So that means I have to come up here and, and do um, import pandas as PD. Cute little uh, data science library. And now this is a little bit better. So what is the shape of this matrix? It's 10 by 400. So what does this mean? We know that we have 10 Collins novels. And we know that we have 400 of the most frequent words that appear in all of those. Uh, so this is great, but we're missing a few things. We're missing, as you can see, we're missing uh, column labels and row labels. So the column labels we know are words. So we can get that out of the TFIDF uh, vectorizer. We could say get feature names. Um, I can call this Collins word names. How many of these do I have? Let's run Lin on it. 400. That's right. So I have 400 columns, Collins word names. Let's look at that. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Right. So these are the frequencies of all of these words, which are the most common words in these 10 Collins novels. So those look like plausible frequencies because we're, we are looking at the most common words. So this one appears like 1.8% of the time, about, that sounds about right. But we're still missing all of those rows. Uh, so we could say that our index, which is pandas terminology for the rows, um, is, what did I call that? Something titles, Collins titles. Great. So now you can see we are comparing the frequencies of all of these words here um, in this big data frame. I can call this Collins DF for Collins data frame. And we could do the same thing that we did uh, before, where we're looking for a word and how it occurs in this whole corpus. It doesn't like that. Oh yeah, because diamond doesn't occur that much. So, oh right, yeah, because they're columns in this case. So 
he, uh, the male pronoun, how does it occur across all of these? Let's plot that as a bar chart while we're at it. It's biggest in the black robe. Miss or Mrs. question mark. Surprisingly has the second highest incidence of this, of this male pronoun, which I wouldn't have expected given that title. All right, so, you know, there are a number of other things that we could do with those. Um, you know, this data frame that we have, you know, we could look at the words that occur disproportionately, you know, in some of these texts rather than others. But stylometry is all about uh, comparing how all of these words together um, are different from all of the words together in another text. So the way we do that is by um, considering this data frame as a 400 dimensional uh, data frame. So that just means, you know, we have 400 words, 400 of the most frequent words, and, you know, these are the dimensions of our data. And what we want to do is collapse this into just a few so that, uh, you know, We'll try two, for example, because two dimensions is really nice to be able to plot uh, because we have X and we have Y, so we could plot it on a Cartesian plane really easily. So to do that, um, we are going to use a dimensionality reduction technique, uh, which is built into Scikit-Learn, um, and it's called PCA, or Principal Component Analysis. So yeah, let's find that. It's called sklearn. Um, I think it's in decomposition. And it's uh, PCA. So PCA, oh, import PCA. So I'm just going to annotate this. So PCA is principal component analysis and what this does is just it considers all of these columns right it considers all of the you know all of the frequencies of all of these words um, in a single text and it tries to condense those into just two you know so it you know you can imagine one way of thinking about it is flattening something so you know if you have a three-dimensional uh, chart with lots of points in this three-dimensional space. Um, if you flatten it, you're projecting those dots onto like a two-dimensional space. So you're losing information, but you're retaining relations between them. You know, because if you have one point here and one point over here that are really fall, far apart, when you collapse it, you know, um, if you collapse it in the right way, it's going to retain that distance. So what PCA tries to do is retain uh, the distances between these things. So as to retain the information, but allow us to um, look at it in a way that's more useful, like in two dimensions instead of uh, 400. So um, the two dimensions that it comes up with, I can just annotate this by saying it collapses our 400 dimensions most frequent words to two dimensions tries uh, to retain that information. That information is known as eigenvectors and um, eigenvalues. Uh, we won't really talk about that or get into that in too much detail. But if you've ever taken a, a course in linear algebra, this is all stuff that you uh, learn in much more detail. Okay, so um, so first we have to instantiate this object, of course. So we have to sort of give it all of the options that we want. So we tell it 
uh, that we want two dimensions as output and we can save all of the other stuff for later. Um, now if we do the same thing where we run fit transform on our matrix, you know, and where was our matrix, our original matrix? Collins uh, Freak. What is this going to give us? Okay, so it gives us this array, which is, it gives us this matrix. So Collins uh, reduced is the output of that PCA. So, so what did it give us? What's the shape of that matrix? It's 10 by two. So that means it's 10 texts um, and it's in two dimensions. So each of these two dimensions is two points, an X and a Y. So we can plot this as a scatter plot if we want to, uh, because we have an X and a Y coordinate for each text. And those coordinates represent the first and the second components of this principal component analysis, which are just, all it is is just the word frequencies that have been squashed down uh, from 400 into two. So if we look at that again, you know, this just means that the first one is the moonstone. Second one, I forget what that one is, but this is at negative 0.07 and negative uh, 0.02. Those are just the X and the Y coordinates of uh, the points that represent these texts. So why don't we why don't we plot that? So we can plot this as a scatter plot if we want. Do we still have that attribute scattered? No. What if we try that? Well, it says it requires an X and a Y column. What if we just say X is the first one, Y is the second one? Is that going to work? It doesn't like that. So um, I think we have to give it a name. So we have to say, you know, we have to name these columns. So we could call them first component and second component. Let me just add a little bit of white space here. Right, and I didn't change that at all. So each of these dots here represents a text in Collins's uh, corpus, but we don't know which is which yet so we have to annotate this so to annotate them we can do this thing um, where we assign this plot to something uh, that is typically called ax for axis and then we can add text to it um, yeah I have to look up how I did this really quick All right, so if we look at the documentation here for annotate, it says it takes a string um, and it takes X and Y uh, coordinates. So if, yeah, maybe let's label those rows first uh, because those are Collins titles. And now I can annotate, now I can go through each of those rows. I could say for title and points in I, yeah, I can call this DF. 
this x for axis. Now I'm iterating through this um, to get the title and the points from each one. And let's see if this works. Yeah, yeah, it kind of does. It you know it's it's pretty hard to see. But yeah, so what you're seeing here is um, the relations, the similarity in style, the stylistic similarity between all of these texts. So it says that man and wife and the haunted hotel are um, similar and no name are similar. So yeah, what if we look those up? in Wikipedia or something. What is that going to tell us? So no name and man and wife. Are published are two of his early novels. And yeah, what was the other one? In the Haunted Hotel, A Mystery of Venice. Is it this one? Eighteen seventy nine. So, yeah, here's a bibliography. No name, man and wife. Yeah, I mean, so it would take me a little bit of research, I think, to try to figure out why exactly uh, these three works are clustered here and you know that would be like a great um, exercise uh, for you if anyone wants to go and do that yeah also yeah why are these texts clustering together so this one is kind of hard it's kind of hard to understand this you know because I have only ever read the Moonstone of Collins you know so this isn't a great for me because I can't really understand the logic of this. Um, so why don't we work with something that we know a little bit better or at least yeah or at least I do. So we have a corpus of Collins novels already but yeah why don't I get that NLTK corpus to work with. So up here I'm going to say from NLTK Corpus import Gutenberg. And now down here I could say Gutenberg texts equals text raw file ID for file ID in Gutenberg file IDs. I think it's that. Great. So let's peek at that. Um, we could say, let's look at the first 200 characters of each text. OK, great. Yeah, so we have the text of each of these things from the Gutenberg text that we've um, already worked with before. And now we could pull this into um, scikit-learns. TFIDF vectorizer. We could reuse the same one actually. And we could fit and transform that. I think it was a capital V.
and that's going to give us frequencies sparse matrix we can make it a dense matrix and we can add some labels to it so yeah first yeah let's look at what we need to label yeah so So what is the shape of this thing? So it's 18, so we have 18 text and we have 226 common words. Is that it? That doesn't seem like... Yeah, you know what? We might need to reinitialize this. We might need to get a new vectorizer. So let's, yeah, let's reinitialize this before we do all of that stuff. We still have only 226 words, which is odd. Is it only the, that number of words that appears in all of them? What if we take out this requirement? Okay, now we have 400. So it could only find 226 words that appeared in all of them. Is that it? Weird stuff. Okay, now we have something of the shape that we want. And if we were to put this into a data frame, yeah, we would see that we have like 400 columns and 18 rows. So we know those rows, which Pandas calls an index, are um, the texts. So we can get, we already have the names of all, all of the texts because they're called Gutenberg file IDs. And now our columns are something that we can get from that TF IDF vectorizer and get feature names. And Yeah, so this tells us that these are the frequent words. And we have lots of numbers as part of those frequent words. And these are all of the text that they happen in. And it's already filled in all of the zeros for us. So I can call this Gutenberg uh, data frame. But yeah, what I want to do is transform this. So I already have my PCA object uh, created. So I can fit and transform these frequencies. And I can call this Gutenberg points. And that transforms my 18 texts to an X and a Y coordinate. Um, and then so if I do the same thing where I put this into a data frame and I tell it that the rows are file IDs, give those as labels and the columns are, call them first component, second component. Let's look at that. Great. That's pretty much what we want. So why don't we, yeah, why don't we plot that as a scatter plot? Uh, but we want to annotate this 
at the same time. Um, so to annotate it, we have to give it um, a string label. So I can get that from this data frame. So I can say that the title and the points in the rows of this data frame are what we want to plug into the title and the points in that annotator. And I probably have spelled something wrong. Nope, uh, scatter requires an X and a Y column. Great. Um, I can make this a little bit bigger too, just by doing fig size and you know I could say how about eight by eight. I'm making this square uh, because the proportions here really matter uh, when we're dealing with uh, distances like this. What about six by six? Okay, great. So here you can really see stylometry at work because um, stylometry you know is often used for authorship detection you know if you have a feeling that something might have been written by someone but um, you know it's a little bit dubious the authorship is not entirely a settled question uh, stylometricians will often be called in to do this work of uh, determining who is most likely to have written something and you do this by looking at again you do this by looking at the most frequent words so here I have the three works of Shakespeare are all clustering together in this group over here Milton is kind of close to Shakespeare which makes sense to me uh, Blake's poems cluster together with the Bible and with Whitman which kind of surprises me although Whitman's Whitman is a little bit religious and you know all three of these texts have poetic qualities to them. Um, also, Milton's Paradise Lost is a very dramatic, epic poem, you know, so it's clustering next to this drama. All of the Austin texts are over, over here. Um, we have the children's stories by Sarah Bryant down here next to the children's story of Alice Carroll, and the three Chesterton novels are all um, appearing here as well. Melville apparently is as close to all of the novels almost as he is to Whitman. So does that tell us that, you know, this is kind of like a poetry cluster. This is kind of a drama cluster. This tells us that Milton is kind of like part poetry, part drama, which kind of makes sense. And this tells us over here that Melville is kind of part novel and part poetry, which kind of makes sense to me. Um, this one I haven't read, so I'd be interested to know if any of you have any theories about why that's off on its own. And Austin novels are kind of in their own category too. So you can imagine if you had text X, let's say, you know, and you didn't know who wrote it. You could say, um, well, if it appears over here, it's probably going to be written by Shakespeare. If it appears over here, it's probably going to have been written by Jane Austen. If it appears over here, we might say that it could be poetry. You know, so this is a great way of being able to guess uh, the author or the genre or the time period sometimes of, uh, of a text. So inevitably, um, I always get asked whenever I show a stylometry result like this, what do these axes mean? What does this first component and the second component mean? And these are the word frequencies of the first, in our case, 400 most frequent words of these texts compressed into these two values, X and Y, or first component and second component. You know, so we're looking at a compressed version of all of the most frequent, 400 most frequent words of each of these texts. Okay. 
Yeah, so uh, that's all for today. I encourage you to play around with this stylometry using other corpora. Um, and tomorrow we're going to look at, uh, say, Charles Dickens. And actually, that I might make that homework, Charles Dickens and um, Wilkie Collins. That should be fun. All right, great. Looking forward to talking to you about this tonight.